And welcome back to Talk Recovery of Vancouver Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. That was a little Avid Brothers. And uh, we got uh, another song at the end of the show coming up, a uh, little Barney Benthal. Uh, that was uh, David Pavlis we just spoke with uh, on, on air live in the studio. Uh, and now it is time for Personal Story. It's Personal Story time. Yay! hey <laughs> I was like, where did Dave go? <laughs> Dave's just, just uh, like, totally he's left there. the studio. <laughs> All right, so uh, who are we speaking with today? Okay, so today we're talking to Tanya uh, L. Um, on what is recovery, like her own recovery story, that type of thing. So Tanya, welcome to Talk Recovery. Thank you. Um, yeah, so tell me, when, when did you come into recovery? What did life look like before you came in? Like right before I came into recovery, um, I say it was about 2013. I uh, I kind of I, I went to a really dark place, and luckily my sister had someone in the program who introduced me to NA, and um, you know I just kept relapsing in between meetings, and so for myself, like I had to go to a safe place. So um, I stepped into a treatment center in New Westminster, and uh, my clean date is now February 13. 2014. Ooh, right before Valentine's I Day. I got it's my like, heart back. Yeah, oh, I like that. I, I like that. So 2013, so okay, that's a, the year, like five, six years? Oh, be four years of this February, so. Okay, yeah. sorry, I'm really bad at that. It's okay. <laughs> totally busted now. You're my friend, you should know my clean date. <laughs> okay, it's true, it's just right. Okay, so, um, so what is recovery to you? Like what, what was, uh, like what have you recovered in recovery? What is that? Okay, so recovery to me, um, you know, it's kind of like a transformation from like, you know, like a little caterpillar into like a butterfly. I, uh, I had to like peel some layers into, um, you know, like my childhood and growing up and um, really like take a look at that and have some per perseverance to even like battle those demons. And, um, you know, it took a lot of like hard work and... Um, what was the second question? Um, just what have you recovered in recovery? Oh. But I want to talk to you about those demons before we before we go. Let's go right to the demons, Tanya. <laughs> the dark spot. So, yeah. What what demons do you mean? Like I think there I think there's a disconnect that people have where they think like what makes you what makes you use is the substance. Do you know what I mean? Like people don't understand the like emotional emotional component of recovery that like those demons and how you face those. So, so what do you mean by demons? Okay, so the very first like really hard thing, like my demon was looking at, you know, my brother was murdered as a result of his addiction and um, very tragic um, situation. Him and his girlfriend lives got taken. And it still gets me like a little like, you know, like sad, but um, you know, I had to really like take a look at that because there was like a time where like I remember that day when I got that phone call that my brother died and um, I was in my practicum finishing my last week and I remember us, me and my two sisters got kicked out because they thought like the gangs would come and like we knew too much and like, you know, like they called us the next day and um, you know, let us finish it but like having seen my brother's face in the paper every day for the next week was like the most like gut-wrenching thing because it was like this like you know like I've been involved with a lot of like seeing a lot of gang stuff and um, it's just a really dark place for me so I had to really like get some healing from that because I played you know I, I, I pulled the victim mode for a good four years on that and um, you know like going into recovery and uh, taking a look at like where like I really needed to heal from that because it was one thing that really held me back is um, you know my brother's murder so I think like you know like the 12 steps has really like saved me um, from that from that how, demon. How important was it to be a part of a community? I mean I've never been in a gang um, were you like a gay? No, I wasn't a part of okay. gay, but like but my like brother you was. People, okay. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm, I'm not a gay beggar. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know this about me. <laughs> but I would imagine, like the whole premise from what I've seen in movies is with gangs, is that need for community, that need for belonging, right? And mm -hmm. so I do think that 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 can happen in addiction and that can happen in recovery, right? So mm -hmm. how important is community to you and like? 
friendships and being a part of the 12-step community? Because you're a big part of the 12-step community. You're very involved. Mm -hmm. I think it's super important for me anyways. Um, I, I don't think I would be here, honestly. Um, you know, luckily I got out right before the whole fentanyl thing happened. But, like, if it wasn't for this community and, like, how much unity we have and, like, just jumping right in the middle and doing service, like, I don't think I would be here today. Um, so it's like I continue just to show up and like be involved with women and like help them through their hard times because it's like that's just what we do here, right? So um, I really I'm passionate about um, the community and friendships and everything that we have here. Right, and you just helped uh, service is a big part of what you do, and you're always involved in the dances, which you always try to get me to go to, which I'm <laughs> such a hermit. One yeah, time. yeah, I did go one time. Okay, so, um, <laughs> but anyhow, and uh, yeah, you just did. You were just a part of the New Year's dance and stuff. And so, why do you get involved in those things? Like, what what <laughs> what inspires you? No, actually, the, it was really good. So yesterday, or the day after the dance, I went to a night meeting. And uh, this newcomer shared about, you know, he just came back, he was really defeated, but he went to that dance and he just shared about like, you know, like I actually went to the New Year's dance and then like I had so much fun, like I wasn't triggered and like that moment is like that all that hard work that I just did was for that, is for that newcomer and it gets me emotional because that's just like what we do and like we can have fun. And it's like, I want to promote that. I want to help people be a part of it. And you know, like, I, I gave my sponsee, like, a ticket just so she can come because she had no money. It's like, that's okay. Like, there's a solution for everything, and I want you to be a part of, like, what we're doing and what we're planning. Because it's like, everyone matters, right? Yeah, and I think that's a big part of what the, you know, like, I mean, the fellowship and that sort of thing does. But I would say that, like, the New West recovery scene does really well is like the dances and uh, yeah so the dances and the service and how people are involved and um and you do that really well and you get people involved and like you're super super involved <laughs> like how do you what other things are you doing besides that 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 you're recovering in your life as a, as a as a part of your recovery well this year in january or the year that just passed sorry um i got injured and uh I had to really like focus on not like pain. Dealing with pain is like the worst thing, clean. And um, I really had to be like put my energy into like counseling. Um, so I started seeing a counselor, such a great counselor, and he really like helped me, you know, peel back some more layers that I was dealing with, like stuff from my dad, the relationship, and like you know why I choose unhealthy men in recovery in the beginning, and it was just like all this like crazy things it was so simple but yet so powerful um you know so i really like i really encourage people to you know seek outside counseling because it's something like yeah we have the 12 steps of narcotics anonymous but it's like there's so much more that you can heal from and um so i really did that a lot this year and um you know i just uh i just uh did some schooling right so i got to get retrained and um and then I got to, uh, during this whole process, I got to like do one part of my recovery that was really hindering me, hindering me was uh, my, my financial amends to myself. And um, you know, I just like, hurt, like handed over like a lot of cash to ICBC and it was like, oh my God, it was so defeating. And, um, but it's like, that was one thing that I really wanted to like get, but my sponsor was like, it's not the right time, Tanya, like time, you know, God has a plan for you and just kept reassuring me and like, it just happened. It was just like, holy moly. Like now I have my license and it's like pretty cool. So like this year I really just like kept putting one foot in front of the other and just kept going, kept doing service, meetings, spots, you know, just the basics that we do, right? So it's interesting too because you said that um, you were off work, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, you're injured at work. There's lots of people that would just sit in front of the TV and be depressed and because it sounds like because you were part of the recovery community that that you that you sort of like and I know because I was I know like <laughs> secret I was I was actually there, there. for for yeah. for this so I have inside <laughs> scoop but it's kind of like you know you you did approach it as like okay like my this has happened because of my higher power like mm -hmm. and just being open to like why is this happening mm -hmm. and it's interesting to see mm -hmm. that process of like what's happened in the last year because you're in a totally different spot. Totally. Because when, once your higher power like takes you out of your day-to-day, -day, if you're open, 
then it's great. But if you're close to it, you're like... You're missing the opportunities. Yeah. And it ended up being such an opportunity for you. It's really interesting. Yeah. No, yeah. I just, like, reflect on it. And, like, I was, like, it was a really... It was a struggle. Like, I'm going to be honest. And uh, I just kept, like, just talking about it and talking about it, going to meetings. You know, like, I really... There was one point where I wanted to move up to my mom and, like, be around my family because I just, like, I was hurting so bad that like I just wanted to be around my family but it's like I, ca I just stuck through it and I kept going and um, you know like it's I'm in a totally different place and um, like God had a plan for me and like and this was it and what about your relationships with family like you said that you had a little you you've you've lost your brother and how old was he he was 23 or 24 oh, at the time so young and was he younger than you or older than he you he was older I was older 19. than you okay and and you mentioned a little bit about it, like a bit of a rocky relationship with your dad. So, mm -hmm. what have you been able to recover in terms of in terms of family from like you know when you came in like four or five years ago to now? Um, it's just like getting a level of forgiveness. Um, it's like we're never. I'm never gonna be fully like forgiven or like my forgive my dad. I should say, um, and. Uh, it's just more of a level of acceptance um, that a I don't I don't want my dad in my life today, and b you know like my brother did the best he could, but his addiction got so bad that like you know like I forgive him for that. Um, you know, I don't know like I've really like learned a lot about boundaries this year. Like my sponsor's been really drilling in my head about boundaries. And just, uh, you know, keeping things short, like, sh you know, family visits and, um, you know, because family dynamics gets a little intense, right? Um, but it's, like, more the fact that I can show up and be present for my family. And, um, you know, like, I do have a family member who is on a high dose of methadone. It's, like, he keeps upping her methadone and she's just, like, just watching her just be stuck in that is the most, like, you know, sad thing to watch because I know, like, she wants to get out of it, but she doesn't know how. And it's like the absolute powerlessness of like her addiction that I can just see and I can't do nothing about. So it's just continuing to show up and be there for them, right? Yeah, that's a huge piece that I know um, a lot of friends in recovery deal with is that, uh, you know, it is a family disease and a lot of people in our families, in our close immediate families, uh, are still struggling or either using or they're struggling or they're doing a different mode of treatment and it, it is this place of uh, how do I, how do I, and I mean there's different sort of modes about it too because some people say that you shouldn't be around like as somebody that, as somebody that struggles with addiction as well, that you shouldn't be around that person at all. And then there's other people that say just accept them and love them unconditionally. So what, which camp are you in? I'm in the second one. Um, like, I, I do keep it short if it's, like, a little intense with, you know, family visits, but at the same time, it's, like, I understand where they're coming from, and I've been there, so it's, like, that's what I needed um, when I got to recovery is that, you know, that unconditional love from my family. You know, it was a little tough love, but it was, like, what I needed, so it's, like, I, that's my approach anyways is that part, for sure. Right, and so how hard is it to even, even to watch your family member struggle and want to want to help them and want to show them the way and want to tell them like this is what you do like do this do that you know that sort of thing like how do you kind of stop yourself from doing that well in the beginning of my recovery I was a little self-righteous you know I like pushed a program on it you know but it's like they you know they backed up a bit and um, I remember my counselor just like swearing at me she's like you're so self-centered Tanya I'm like hey whoa whoa she's like you need to make keep doing what you're doing and they will come along and I'm like okay and um you know I've, I've really just taken a step back and just let the process happen and really you know it is tough for me to watch and I'm gonna I'm gonna admit to that like it makes me sad it makes me cry but it's like at the same time they know where to go when they want to make that move and um and I'm grateful for that because I have a lot of connections who are willing to like help me because you know I got there's that balance where I can't there's only so much I can do without like you know hindering my recovery and like so I gotta like you know keep that in check for sure and how like one thing that I learned when I came into the new West recovery was just 
the level of support, like with women's support. And I mean, I'm going to admit it was a, it was a little different for me because, you know, I'm sort of a lone wolf and, uh, and, you know, I'm used to making my own decisions and, you know, living my life. And it, until you get to the point where you really realize like <laughs> me and my decisions are not helping me in this no. area, it's, it can be very different because in mm -hmm. some, in terms of my career, I can make really good decisions. Yeah. It's a little FYI here, but uh, in terms of, you know, relationships and stuff like that, like I struggle, right? And I think a lot of people at addiction do, and we struggle with our parental relationships and then our family relationships and our relationships with other people, right? So what did, uh, what did you learn in recovery and more specifically like in New West recovery around, around the importance of support and like how, like even with your family situation, like how would you handle that and involve your support? Um, <clears throat> so what I've learned is that just support them no matter what. And like, there's a, there's a fine line that if the, if they continue to act out in those behaviors, it's like, I got to stop because it's like, at the same time, I'm enabling that person to continue and listening to that behavior. Right. So it's like, it, it hurts me, but at the same time, I know that could be, you know, an opportunity for them to see that and grow. Um, and, uh, you know, like my family, I, I talk about it. I really do. I talk about my feelings and I talk about, you know, stuff that comes up for me, um, especially with my sponsor. Like she has tremendously helped me out. Um, just a lot about boundaries and like putting myself first because, you know, I'm like, I'm such a giving person. If anyone knows me, I give, give, give. But it's like this year I've learned to stop and just like I need to take because like with this injury, it made me so defeated like I just couldn't had nothing to give and I really just needed to like grab and grab and like fill my cup up again right um so that was a really good learning lesson for me this year okay and I think I think we're just about done here but I wanted to know like you know we're walking up to the downtown east side today we're with Dave and Giuseppe and and you know we're in recovery and there's addiction all around us down here right and so like for anyone out there that's struggling to to get in the doors to you know make the decision do you have any sort of final words you know like there's a lot of hope out there um, and if you're willing to make that decision to walk into a meeting there will be people there to hug you and to shake your hand and to give you the, you know, that, uh, that unconditional love that we need in the beginning. Um, so I hope for everyone who is struggling to reach out and to, you know, just take a chance because it's like, what, what are you losing? Right? So, you know, that's what I did and I'm going to be taking four years soon. That's awesome. Congrats and thanks for listening to Talk Recovery on Vancouver Co-op Radio 100.5 FM been a super great show guys what do you where are you at what do you think I you know I'm just I'm, I'm considering something that, that David said about about how it's like to love someone that doesn't love you mm -hmm. you know like and, and what you would be willing to do for that person who's who you're not getting any love from and and really I mean We'll all be, we'll all argue the fact, you know, if, if you're, if you're an addict and you've used and you've, you know, you've done everything for yourself to, to score dope and get more dope and been absent from your kids' lives or your parents' lives or your brother's lives or whatever the situation, you will always argue and deny, what do you, you know, I love my kids and I love my brother and I love my parents, you know what I mean? Don't say that. But the fact of the matter is, is every action that an addict takes is, is unloving towards people you know it, it, but it, it isn't that person you know it's it's not like that that I, I was un, unable to love and un, unwilling you know to love it, it, it just you just lose yourself and the question is is which individual caught either walking down the street of the Hastings right now or you know somewhere in the burbs you know which individual can get back to that place of of loving their family and, and loving themselves and, and you know, and, and those sort of things. And, and, and the truth is, I think, like, everybody should be, should be, should have the options to know, you know, whether or not they're just going to be self-centered and mean and unkind to people for the rest of their lives on drugs or not, or whether or not they were going to, you know, amend their, their life of, of living in that, like, hellish self-centeredness. Yeah. And, and, you know, give back because those people who do find their nature was loving, was kindness, was gratitude, was giving back. Like, those are the people that could possibly change the world, you know?
Yeah, I was saying to Dave before the show, I said, you know, like, I was thinking the other day that, you know, if there's a higher power, obviously there's like, you know, a negative power, like every, you know, higher, you know, the opposing force kind of thing. And, and the thing, and he said, yeah, it's addiction, right? Like, yeah, the higher power and addiction, right? And I think that's the, like, I know for me, like at my first bottom, I've had a couple, but my first one, it was like, you know, my higher power saved me. Like, I, I know that. And it's like, I think like when you're crazy and when you're insane and when you are addicted, you are crazy and insane. And like the way out is for me anyways, and for countless other people, a higher power, like asking for help from a higher power. Like it sounds, it sounds hokey. Just give it a shot. Yeah. And I like what Tanya had to say, like, you don't never give up, you know, like, there, there's you don't know who you're gonna inspire next by sharing your story so mm -hmm. thanks so much for coming down today and and, and sharing that that bit about yourself and, and your story um, thanks for listening thanks for watching Facebook live uh, all our fans out there uh, and like Giuseppe said earlier in the show like see if you you know can't donate a little bit to the Vancouver co-op radio and become a member and keep our shows rolling and with that uh, thanks for listening stay tuned next week and we're gonna we're gonna leave off today with a little Barney Bentall and Legendary Hearts living in the '90s on Talk Recovery. Great show. Say bye, everyone. Just leave this. Just leave this. Just leave this.